Welcome to Go After Dark. This is a series where we relax and code some nice graphical effects. In this episode, we'll create a very classic effect. It's called a rotor zoom. It allows you to zoom and rotate uh, an image, and it's used in a lot of uh, old school demos. The effect was used in a classic demo from 1993 called Second Reality, but it has been used in a lot of demos both before and after. While this is a great standalone effect, it uh, also introduces a lot of concepts we'll be using in the future for things like texture mapping. So let's dive into the code. All the initialization is the same as last time. So let's skip straight to the um, to the rendering part. First of all, let's take a look at what we are what we're doing. So here we have a nice happy gopher that spins around and zooms in and out. So this will be the effect we'll um, take a look at. The first thing we do is calculate an angle which is in radians, which means it goes from zero to two pi. The next thing is we create a scale by how much we want the image to be zoomed in and out. To illustrate the next step, I've created a small change that will allow us to take a look at the effect from a different perspective. Basically, this displays the texture space of the effect we're doing. So when we advance the effect, uh, I'm drawing the, uh, the top, left, right and bottom lines onto the texture. So the top left corner here is the output top left corner. For, uh, for every output pixel, we increment by a fraction the total image. So when we end up here, we are on the left side of the screen which means the area inside, uh, inside here is what's displayed on the output. So you uh, can see as, uh, as it grows and rotates, the, uh, the slope of the lines change. And as we get even bigger, it overlaps onto the next image, which means the texture is, uh, is repeated. So when we increment it further, we get a lot of uh, overlaps and we can see we begin skipping pixels. Uh, so there's now gaps in the lines, which means we don't actually read every pixel, but we skip some of them. So basically this is how the, uh, the effect progresses if you see it in texture space. So let's go back and take a look at how that is done in effect space, so to speak. So when dealing with textures, instead of using X and Y, we use U and V to differentiate between screen space and texture space. Texture space was the space where the coordinates and the texture we're drawing and X and Y are the coordinates on our screen. So what this leads to is we calculate for every output X coordinate, how much should U and V be incremented and for every Y, so every line, how much should U and V be incremented. That's the, the describes the slopes of our, of our texture. This allows us to move it freely on the, uh, on the image. So the next thing we need to calculate are the UV coordinates of a very first pixel, meaning the top left pixel. We do that by defining the screen space coordinates we want the zoom and rotation to happen at. We also need to define where on the texture we want the zoom and rotation to occur at. In both cases, we choose the center of the screen and the center of the texture. And we use these coordinates to define the initial U and V for the top left pixel. Finally, we have the same values as in our last effect um, that 
defines the shifts for the Y coordinate and the masks that help us wrap the texture. So now we are ready to draw our pixels. We range through our lines. On every line, when starting, we reset our U and V to the coordinates we want on the left side of the image. And when we're done drawing the line, we increment them to what we want them to be at the next line. For every pixel in the line, we simply look up the U and V value in the texture and use that as our output. And we increment the U and V with the values we want to add every pixel we go to the right. So that's actually it. As you can see, we only added a small amount of complexity compared to our last effect, but now we have way more flexibility in uh, how we can address textures because we can basically arrange it any way we want. Compared to last time, we also got rid of the uh, multiplication we had for every pixel. So everything is now additions and simple bit operations. So that was actually everything that was needed to make our zoomer from last episode also rotate. Let's launch it again. Take a look. Um, I've uh, also been asked what this bar on the left side represents. The green bar is a remnant from the old days. What you do to benchmark your code is when you are done rendering re your frame, you switch the background color to something else. So the time spent rendering every frame is uh, indicated by the length of the green bar. The further down it goes, the longer it took to, uh, to calculate that frame. Since I'm recording this video and other things are going on on my computer, this uh, is a bit unstable, but in general, it gives you a good idea of how fast your uh, effect is. Good thing is, it's also easy to correlate with changes. So if the bar gets longer, it indicates that your effect is slower. This will, of course, also vary based on what system you have. Uh, so you probably have a, a shorter bar because you are not recording video. So yes, that's the uh, mystery of the uh, green bar, but it can give you good indication of performance problems or various things that are very slow. Thank you for watching the third episode of Go After Dark. In the next episode, we'll take a look at another classic effect called a tunnel effect. Until then, you can visit afterdark.classpost.com where you can find links to the code. You can also see the effect in the browser. Feel free to subscribe here on YouTube or follow me on Twitter to find out when new episodes are out. You can also share your own creations with the hashtag GoAfterDark. But until next time, thank you and good night. <laughs>